Okay, so <clears throat> it's with a great sense of uh, relief and pride that I stand uh, with you uh, today to tell you about Mossfire, which, uh, you know, the bottom line of, of this talk is that it works. Whew. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's, it's actually been very exciting, and I was, uh, um, this is a picture actually taken with Mossfire uh, during <clears throat> the first observing run about a year ago now. And uh, we don't have a whole lot of pretty pictures like this because MOSFIRE was built primarily to do the job of spectroscopy of lots of objects in the near infrared. Um, and it does really well for imaging too, but we never took that much time to, to use it in that way so far. So why do you need the near infrared? Well, we already heard about adaptive optics. Uh, this is not an adaptive op optics instrument. It is uh, a so-called seeing-limited instrument, <clears throat> and uh, it bent, it, its power is in its ability to get spec spectra of very faint objects and to do lots of them at one time. Um, <clears throat> so why does this change the, the whole field? Well, it's because a lot of times you need a sample to say anything about what's actually the, the underlying truth out there, and uh, doing one at a time is possible but it's extremely expensive and not very, um, <clears throat> not, not very realistic much of the time unless you can get them to give you a whole telescope all to yourself, which is rarely the case. Um, so the other thing is if you're trying to do something hard, it sure helps to have 30 of uh, possible <laughs> um, risky objects on slits in your spectrograph than it does to have one and wonder whether you're wasting your time. Uh, and this is a, it's a psychological thing, of course, but it's going to make a huge difference. Now, Keck has had, since day one, uh, <clears throat> state-of-the-art optical wide-field spectrometers, and many of the same science that has been uh, addressed with these spectrographs is also, going, is also has been waiting to be addressed in the near-infrared. Uh, but it's been confined to, to small fields of view, uh, <clears throat> and in terms of spectroscopy, one, or one at a time. And um, I'm very glad to say that the era of what I call wholesale near-infrared spectroscopy is finally here. Um, <clears throat> here's a, um, a few pictures, and I think Ian showed this earlier this morning. This is just showing the imaging field of view, an image of a uh, configured slit mask, and then... Uh, <clears throat> one switches from a mirror that does the imaging to a grating which disperses all those little slits into spectra, as you see there. And this is just showing that um, <clears throat> it worked on the first night that we had it on the sky. <clears throat> and I, and I, as part of this, getting ready for this, I decided it was <clears throat> to go back and try to figure out a little bit about the history of moss fire, and it was shocking. Um, <clears throat> Because um, I, you know, it basically started in the middle part of 2004, which was nine years ago, um, <clears throat> and uh, you know I, I couldn't even really remember that it was that this long ago. Um, that Siri, all the all the beginning stages of trying to put this thing together, which involved a bunch of people, uh, without whom none of it would have been possible, um, and we were sort of living hand to mouth in terms of funding to keep this going. Um, and it turns out that the NSF program that we were depending on um, to fund the whole thing got halved uh, in 2005, and we, were, we would have been dead in the water, except that Gordon and Betty Moore gave us $5 million to be able to continue work on MOSFIRE, and it, I wouldn't be here today if that weren't the case, and, and it, as it turns out, the rest of the instrument was funded by a combination of the NSF funds and the uh, <clears throat> um, and the, the more gift. Now, I, I, I don't want to bore you with all these dates. It doesn't matter. It's just a really long haul to build one of these things. And the reason is you're, bu you're building a prototype. So you not only do you not know exactly how smoothly things are going to go, um, you, you know, you're doing one. And that's the only one you're ever going to do. Maybe not true in Mossfire's case, but that's another story. Um, <clears throat> but it's the only one you're ever going to do, and, and you don't, you know, you, you have a sort of innocent um, 
and uh, I guess uh, optimistic view of things when you start uh, working on something like this. And it's amazing how many things can actually go wrong. And it's amazing how many places there's one person who knew how to solve a problem, and that person solved it. And we are lucky enough to have within our community, the uh, WMKO community, people who are like that, who can, uh, can solve these things. The point being, these things are hard, but they really are essential. If we hadn't been developing instruments since uh, 20 years ago, Keck would not be on the map, even though it's the greatest telescope. <clears throat> so what is MOSFIRE? Well, it's, it's a wide field imaging spectrometer, meaning it takes images and it takes spectra. Um, I'm not going to go through all this, this stuff uh, in any detail. I wanted to, to mention just this bit here. And this is, has to do with the difficulty of making in, near-infrared instruments. Um, essentially what MOSFIRE is, do I have a picture? Here, there's a picture. <clears throat> it's a big can inside which you put a huge uh, multi-object imaging spectrograph, and then you seal that can, and hopefully you never have to open it again once it's cold, uh, because that's the ideal situation. Now, it's awfully hard to handle that when you have to change slit masks every day, as you do in instruments like LoRes and Deimos. Uh, in fact, it really isn't. Um, it's an accident waiting to happen. And so from day one, we uh, worked with a Swiss company called CSEM to build a giant switch, uh, Swiss watch mechanism, essentially, <clears throat> that would electronically configure these focal plane masks instead. Here's a, <clears throat> a close-up view of what this thing looks like. And uh, again, this group of people at this Swiss company, it was about a half a dozen of them, and <clears throat> they'd never done it before for a working instrument, and we had to work with them. And we didn't know if it was going to end up working or not. Um, <clears throat> we just had to try. Um, so what you get with MOSFIRE are huge gains over what we had in the past, even at Keck. Um, <clears throat> we've been using NERSSPEC uh, in a role as a low-resolution spectrometer um, since 1999. And when you include the, both the gain in efficiency, um, <clears throat> Uh, largely due to uh, state-of-the-art detectors, uh, <clears throat> as well as the, the multiplex factor. It's about a factor of 200 gain over what we had um, in the past. Uh, it's sort of superior in every way to what we had access to before. <clears throat> um, here's an example image that you saw on the first slide. And here is what the same field would have looked like with NERC, the original imager on the Keck telescopes. NERC was a great instrument. It was state-of-the-art at the time in 1993. But MOSFIRE has a 100 times bigger field of view. And so it seemed sensible for non-AO imaging um, <clears throat> that NERC didn't have to handle it anymore. And in fact, MOSFIRE has the same very high sensitivity that NERC had. It just has more field. <clears throat> this was an image taken on the, the very first night. Um, produced Im good images from the very start. We weren't too surprised about that since we had lots of opportunity in the lab to check things out. I wanted to say a few words about the team. This is really important in our community. And this was a multi-institutional project from the very start. Um, it involved <clears throat> Caltech, UCLA, um, Santa, UC Santa Cruz, the observatory, and these Swiss folks, all of whom worked together to produce this. Uh, Ian McLean and, and I were co-PIs, and Sean Adkins is the instrument program manager. And I wanted to, to remark again on this particular person who is worth a little bit more than his weight in gold. Um, Keith Matthews, a, as Tom said earlier, he will, he's about to deliver his fourth Keck instrument. Um, I think that makes him the most valuable player overall. Um, in that whole scene, and, and he was with us all the way along this process. And I wanted to um, really, it's too bad that Keith, Keith isn't here. Uh, he should probably be up here t telling you all about the, the 97 near-infrared instruments he's built in his career or something like that. Um, <clears throat> um, there are a whole bunch of other people involved, and they're listed here, the green, uh, uh, 
folks are graduate students at UCLA and Caltech who were uh, very heavily involved in the project. And I wanted also to, <clears throat> to point out that commissioning the instrument and everything that went along with it um, really needed cooperation, very close cooperation with the folks at Keck, obviously. Uh, and I wanted to especially say our, um, I can't remember what the, what the official name is for the, some, the person who's the, the, the expert. It's the, what is it? Instrument master, that's what I was looking for. Mark Cassis, who I think is here somewhere. There he is. Thank you, Mark. Um, <clears throat> well, let me uh, just show you a few pictures. <clears throat> this camera lens here is a little bit more than your average um, Canon off-the-shelf kind of thing. Um, you can see it's about as, uh, it, it's about as big as uh, a person. And uh, it, it includes all sorts of crystalline and glass materials, which generally speaking, don't like to be cooled or heated. Uh, and um, unfortunately, they're inside the cryostat, and they have to be able to handle being cooled down uh, <clears throat> to whatever it is, minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, so literally two years were spent figuring out how to mount the lenses so that they'd be safe when they cooled down. Um, it sounds really tedious, but no one had done it be before with anything this big, and so we had to do it. Here's some pictures as Mossfire was about to finish. Here it's dangling above the concrete floor inside the clean room, uh, which was sort of nerve-wracking, but not nearly as nerve-wracking as when it was being transported up above everything else in this high bay uh, on its way out toward the door, <clears throat> where it was put in this huge box. Um, and this is a, a bunch of the Mossfire team that was present for the boxing. Um, and it went out on that day, February of last year. And uh, here's a picture in March of last year where it's about to bit get plugged into the back of the Keck-1 telescope. And here we are after our first successful commissioning run. And I tried to label everyone. Um, <clears throat> uh, there wasn't a lot of space to do it. But <clears throat> again, the graduate students involved are coded green. I wanted to particularly point out uh, Nick Conadaris, who was really extremely valuable in the last few years of the Mossfire project. He was a postdoc working with us on Mossfire and is still um, involved in, uh, in trying to make sure it continues to work uh, well for everyone. So I wanted to say a few words about science because um, I was afraid that I wouldn't have any time. Um, <clears throat> so this guy, Edwin Hubble, found that the universe was expanding, and this happened, you know, a long time ago, but not that long. And uh, one of the consequences of Hubble's discovery is that um, you get to see the universe as it was in the past by looking at uh, progressively more distant objects. And so one of the things that happens is you, if you have something that has a spectrum where you have these spikes, which are um, known transitions of known elements or ions, um, they get, <clears throat> as you get farther and farther away, uh, they get shifted toward longer wavelengths. And so you can actually dial in whatever cosmic epoch you want by choosing uh, what redshift to focus on, and you'll be seeing the light as it was when it left, um, <clears throat> rather than as it is now. Um, here's a very technical diagram um, that tells what we know about the history of star formation and galaxies in the universe. Um, <clears throat> and the point is, it wasn't uniform in the past. If you go back far enough, you don't see anything at all because galaxies hadn't had a chance to do anything. Uh, then there was a period of time, a, a few billion years, uh, which you might think of as adolescence for the young universe, where a lot of galaxy growth was happening. And um, this, you might, um, you might term the most exciting time in the history of the universe after the Big Bang itself, um, because there's a lot going on in here. It turns out lots of <clears throat> star formation in galaxies. Galaxies are forming at that time, 10 to 12 billion years ago. And also supermassive black holes are accreting and producing energy um, <clears throat> from the black holes. And it's, all these processes are peaking here. And my personal interest in MOSFIRE from day one 
was addressing this part of the universe's history, which is ideally suited to do. Um, I should point out, the galaxies, we already know that they look different. Here are today's galaxies. Here's what they look like 10 to 12 billion years ago. Those are Hubble images. You can see that it's, uh, it's a very interesting cosmic Rorschach test, but you can see anything you want in, in those things, and you don't really know what's going on until you take spectra to find out. <clears throat> now, MOSFIRE, as I mentioned, is an imager, so you can get very deep images of the near-infrared sky. These are two in uh, J and K, just showing that it's possible. These are about six arc-minute fields. Um, <clears throat> when you design a mask to be used to get spectra of some of the objects that you find, um, it produces an overlay that you can put right on top of the field like this, and that shows where each slit is sitting on top of the galaxy that's to be observed spectroscopically. <clears throat> and here is an actual MOSFIRE mask, and it works the same way as low-res and DEMOS do, essentially. There are a few wrinkles that have to do with working in the near-infrared um, <clears throat> and working with something that has a quantized slits rather than slits that you can have begin and end anywhere you want. These are all in units of seven uh, seconds of arc long. And <clears throat> we, the same way that we do with other instruments, we line up the mask very precisely by knowing where some reasonably bright stars are. Everything else in the field is so hopelessly faint that we wouldn't be able to tell if we were lined up or not until we were finished. <clears throat> this is what happens when you put in the, uh, take the mirror out and put in the grating, which disperses the light. And this is just a three minute exposure and everything you see is background. So background, getting rid of the background is absolutely crucial in, in an instrument in the near infrared as we've heard already. And a lot of the way that MOSFIRE works was, um, <clears throat> was thought of all the way along as optimizing the ability to get rid of the background uh, to look at faint targets. And uh, we, we have a scheme, at least for the moment, that works quite well. And, and we also have a data reduction pipeline, which means literally um, you can go home with completely reduced data at the end uh, that you've done as you go along during an observing run, um, <clears throat> in principle at least. Uh, and here's an, this is an example of that same mask that we saw. And this is after it's been background subtracted and then shifted so that they all cover the same uh, wavelength range from left to right because the slits are staggered, and so they actually produce little spectra that have slightly different wavelength ranges. And this is a, this is a non-cheating central portion of this mask that has essentially something interesting on every single slit. Um, and it used to be that we would have to do these one at a time, um, and we would struggle even with the one at a time uh, for various reasons, uh, and it's now become really like shooting fish in a barrel. And the reason, <clears throat> the reason things have improved so much, I hesitate to show a spectrum, um, <clears throat> only because everyone says you can't show spectra to real people. Um, uh, but, but this one, I think, is worth seeing, because this is not atypical. This is a galaxy that are at a redshift of 2.4, which means about um, 10 and a half billion light years distance. Um, and this is the spectrum, and you can see that there, um, this yellow line is essentially at zero. There's a, actually no continuum light that you can see very easily in this case, but they, it has these huge emission lines. And this is the green line that makes planetary nebulae look green. This is oxygen 3, 5007, and <clears throat> it's shifted up into to about 1.7 microns. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that the signal to noise ratio is so high that you can't even see the noise level. Um, <clears throat> and all of this uh, benefits tremendously to lots of different science that one wants to do. And these are just a list of the kinds of things that get improved. We're talking about chemistry, dynamics of the galaxies, um, the precision with which we can measure their redshifts, meaning um, map making in three dimensions is much more precise. We can tell exactly where the galaxies are along the line of sight. Um, <clears throat> we can measure all sorts of physical parameters in these galaxies in a way that's completely complementary to what we could have done 
with optical instruments on the same objects. And so it's gotten to the point where with a 10 meter telescope, this is just a little two arc minute square piece of sky, everything with a circle on it has a measured spectrum either from low res or from um, MOS fire. And these are almost all redshifts between one and a half and three and a half, which is about uh, uh, <clears throat> 10 to 12 billion light years away. And so you can see the reason you want a multi-object spectrograph is because there are lots of these things all in the same region, uh, and they're all accessible now. Here's an example of what we've had <clears throat> for a while are the actual rest frame far ultraviolet spectra that showed essentially the light from the youngest stars being born in the galaxy. And these are the corresponding MOS fire spectra, where again, you see very little in the way of continuum, but you see these extremely strong lines which are produced in, in um, H2 regions that are ionized by the young stars that are being born as this galaxy forms. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just try to make it visceral how things have changed. Um, <clears throat> here's a, a little diagram. You don't even worry about what, it, what it's saying. Uh, it took us uh, about seven years worth of NERSPEC data, um, about 30 nights on the telescope, to construct this diagram. And he, even then, we cheated, and each of these points is from averaging together 15 um, spectra obtained with NERSPEC in order to measure something that required better sensitivity. Um, <clears throat> so if you were to look, um, uh, that was not supposed to do that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, forget it. Here's the spectrum of the same integration time that we took with NERSPEC. Now, NERSPEC was a, is a great instrument, still great in, in the way that it's still unique, which is in the high resolution mode. But this spectrum here was about an hour with NERSPEC. And you can see, and it was a signal noise of about 10 or so. And this spectrum taken with the same integration time, this is the hydrogen alpha line. At a, it, which is red if you were to see it in the rest frame, but here appearing at about 2.2 uh, <clears throat> microns wavelength. The signal to noise is 70, and that makes a huge uh, difference. Here's another example, same sample. We used NERSPEC a lot, and we banged our head against the wall, um, <clears throat> again, over a very long period of time. And we got four points in this part of the diagram which was suggesting that the galaxies in the distant universe were very different from these, this gray cloud, which is all the galaxies from uh, star-forming objects from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, <clears throat> so when MOSFAR came along, um, we, got <clears throat> uh, we have about 100 a, a of these that are populating this area. And these all have to be very good spectra because you have to detect all of these lines. Uh, again, this is the low, the, these are galaxies in the nearby universe. And this is saying that uh, the, the places near where the stars are forming are very, very different in the high redshift universe than they are now. And we don't know how to make use of this information properly yet because they're so different. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that a simple scaling would uh, suggest that it would take 175 years of NERSPEC time to get those points on the diagram. Um, just, uh, just kidding. So I just wanted to, <clears throat> I can't get that much time. <laughs> um, MOSFIRE is a very powerful new capability and it was built by collaboration, making use of all the collective expertise in our community. And it was funded by a partnership between federal funds and, and, uh, <clears throat> and the gift from the, uh, the Moors and both were essential to make this happen. Uh, and, of course, new capabilities, new discoveries, um, and continued leadership for Keck are something that we all want, and this is the kind of story and process by which that happens. And I wanted to finish with thanking a, a few folks. I wanted to thank, once again, Gordon and Betty Moore for their donation to this project, and also the NSF and the TSIP program, which no longer exists, but while it did exist, it, it was a very worthwhile endeavor. And um, <clears throat> it, uh, I wanted to thank in particular the folks at NOAO who were administering the program, who we talked to once a month, and who actually were really interested and really helpful in talking with us about issues that we'd face. And of course, all, to all of our colleagues along the way who um, 
pointed out um, things that we were doing wrong or um, uh, bad thinking on our parts or just giving us excellent advice and that was extremely useful. So thank you. <laughs>